Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Author, pastor, and one-time atheist Lee Strobel said in one sermon, how can I tell you the difference God has made in my life? My daughter Allison was five years old, he said, when I became a follower of Christ, and all she had known in those five years was a dad who was profane and angry. I remember one night I came home and I kicked a hole in the living room wall just out of anger with life. I am ashamed to think of the times Allison hid in her room to get away from me. Five months after I gave my life to Jesus Christ, that little girl went to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for daddy. At age five, he said, what was she saying? She'd never studied the archeological evidence regarding the truth of the Bible. All she knew was her dad used to be this way, hard to live with, but more and more dad is becoming this way. And if that's what God does to people, then sign her up. And at age five, she gave her life to Christ. You see, God changed my family. He changed my world. He changed my eternity. He changed me. Having trusted Christ as Savior, God can work a wonderful work in us in transforming our hearts and lives as, as well as transforming our relationships with those close to us in life, our spouses, our children, our friends, employers. What we find in the verses before us are practical exhortations that flow out of an inward spiritual transformation of uh, mind and will. The life that God commends us to in these verses is the result of Romans 12, 1 and 2, presenting ourselves to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, as verse 1 beseeches us to do. And then as we are not conformed to this world, but instead are transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the Word of God, our thinking will change and our lives will change. Romans 12, 9 reads, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Paul says in verse 9, Let love be without dissimulation. And the term dissimulation means hypocrisy. Let your love be real without hypocrisy is the instruction for us, the church here. God desires that we have a sincere, real love for all people because God loves all people and Christ died for all. An unhypocritical, genuine love is the love of God. Out of His genuine love for us, He spared not His own Son, it says in Romans 8, but delivered Him up for us all. For His Son to be crucified and to face his wrath against our sins, to pay our sin debt in full by His shed blood that we might have eternal hope in Christ. And that is real love. And as a member of the church, the body of Christ, God's love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who's been given to us. And now we are to be the channel of His sincere, genuine love to this world. We demonstrate this real love as we allow God to work through us and we serve and we help others in our homes, in our church, and in life. And we demonstrate this genuine love when we reach out and we share the gospel of grace with the lost and unbelieving. That is the highest act of love in caring for someone's eternal soul. This caution about love is really the theme of the rest of the chapter, Romans 12 here, as Paul shows what love without dissimulation is. And he elaborates on what genuine love does and how it affects our attitude and our actions and our relationships with others. Paul says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Living by a transformed and renewed mind by the Word of God, we should hate sin and evil just as God hates sin and evil. And we should cleave to that which is good. And we should cleave to the Word of God because it is good. Psalm 97, verse 10, 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. 
We hate sin and evil because of its consequences and what it does to people and how it destroys lives. And Paul says, cleave or cling, grip, hold tightly to that which is good and right. And God's Word teaches us what is truly good, and we should cling to it. And God's Word teaches us that God is good, and we should cling tightly to Him by faith. And by cleaving to God and cleaving to His Word, we will be kept from sin and evil, and our love will be without dissimulation. Romans 12, verse 10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. The term kindly affectioned speaks of a natural, tender, family-type affection. Having trusted Christ as Savior, that He died for you and for your sins personally and rose again, we are born again, and we are born into the family of God. And in the church, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Thus, we should have a family-type bond and warm affection for one another as family in the Lord. One commentator put it this way, Love the brethren in the faith as though they were brothers in blood. In Christ, we are, you could say, we are brothers and sisters by the blood. Christ shed blood. And we are to love each other with a strong, brotherly, family-type love. And as in a family, where you watch out for one another, you care for one another, you give counsel to one another, you help each other, encourage each other, you're always there for each other, we should do the same with our family in Christ. And Paul says how we should also be in honor preferring one another. This reminds us of Philippians 2.3 where Paul says, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Manifesting a love without dissimulation, without hypocrisy, out of humility, we should be treating each other as more important than ourselves. Now, saying this is one thing. Doing it is another thing altogether. Because our old nature and our natural impulse is to think of self first. And the judge look for faults in others, not to prefer them or esteem them better than ourselves. But when we obey this and carry it out by the power of the Holy Spirit, it demonstrates a transformed, renewed mind and the humble mind of Christ in our lives and that we're living by God's Word. God says, prefer your brother, respect him, treat him as more important than yourself. Paul has shown how we ought to have a devalued view of self and a greater realization of the value of others in God's sight and the value they are to the church, the body of Christ and to appreciate them and their life and their gifts and their service to the church. And along with this, this instruction works great. It's guaranteed to work in marriages as well, in honor, preferring one another. Romans 12, 11 says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. This phrase, not slothful in business, is speaking of the business of spiritual matters, the works and duties and responsibilities that need to be done by the body of Christ in service to others. And Paul says, don't be slothful in these things. We're not to be shrinking away, lazy, sluggish, hesitating when it comes to the work that needs to be done for the Lord. Paul says that we should not, he tells you what we should not be when it comes to the Lord's work. Then he tells you how we should be. And he says, fervent in spirit. Uh, that labor that needs to be done by the body should be done with spiritual fervor. We should be fervent in the spirit. The phrase speaks of a burning desire, a fire in the belly, an ardent and a flame zeal, an enthusiastic desire to get after the things that need to be done and for the Lord. We do so with the motivation of love and grace, which, which that drives you to do even more when you serve in light of the love of Christ and dying for us and rising again in light of the amazing grace that set us free from sin and made us righteous in the sight of God forever. We're fervent in the Spirit because there's many to reach and there are so many who need the love and grace and care of the Lord in ministry. And we are to labor fervently knowing that we are serving the Lord. We are His servants. He is our Lord. Our labor is not for self. We serve the Lord. It's not done for self-glory. It's to bring Him glory. 
We labor hard for that and to bring glory to our blessed Savior who rescued us. And we gratefully serve Him to please Him and so others may know Him as their Savior as well. Romans chapter 12, verses 12 to 13 say, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given the hospitality. As we are serving the Lord, we're rejoicing in our hope in Christ. We serve with joy, rejoicing in the Lord always, knowing that the Lord might come today at the rapture of the church, knowing that we're heaven bound as we're serving the Lord on our journey through life, knowing also that we serve, that we have hope, the sure hope of eternal life in Christ. And because of our hope, we can be patient in tribulation. We can quietly endure through trials and challenges in life or ministry, knowing by faith that the Spirit helpeth our infirmities and that God works all things together for good. Earlier in the book of Romans, we learned about these things. And as we are serving the Lord, Paul says we should constantly pray to our Lord and be instant in prayer. Prayer is part of our fervent service and labor, and it's what we do as we labor for Him. When needs are seen in the ministry, we're to be instant in prayer. In other words, we bring that need to Him now. When we need guidance, we pray now. Take it to the Lord. When there's a problem, we pray immediately about that problem. When we hear of someone needing salvation or physical healing, we are to be instant in prayer. It's a good thing to practice and a good idea too because often we forget if we don't pray right away. So it's good to be instant in prayer. It's to be a frame of mind, a habit of life, to take needs to the Lord in prayer instantly. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Romans is a hardcover 452-page verse-by-verse commentary written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stamm. Paul's epistle to the Romans is one of the most profound, yet one of the most enlightening books of the Bible, indeed of all literature. Nowhere else in the Bible do we find the great doctrines of the Christian faith set forth so completely or systematically. Thus, we wholeheartedly agree with the statement, the Book of Romans is the Bible within the Bible. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. In our service in living the transformed life, we should be distributing to the necessity of the saints. God is generous, and He desires a generous heart from us, His own. Having been bought by the blood of Christ, bought with that price, we belong to God, and all that we have belongs to Him. And at times, as we're serving the Lord, He desires us to help saints in need from His means that He has entrusted us with. While there is much need in the world today in the sufferings of humanity, God's teaching us something here, that beside our physical family, our first responsibility is to our spiritual family in Christ, as we are to be distributing to the necessity of the saints. We are to help meet the needs of the saints, fellow members of the body of Christ with material aid. And Paul says also that we should be given to hospitality, which speaks of readily pursuing love to strangers. Hebrews 13.2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Titus 1.8 speaks of how elders of the church need to be a lover of hospitality. Believers need to be watchful, alert to the needs of strangers, ready to reach out, willing to 
open their homes if need be, or to give and to show love to people in need. Romans 12, verses 14 and 15 say, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Paul moves on in these verses to speak of the believer's reactions to the actions and emotions of others. In 1 Corinthians 4.12, Paul stated, Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Our Lord also said in His earthly ministry to Israel, Bless them that curse you. This is God's desire for us that by grace, we don't react in pride and anger to those who persecute or tear us down, but instead we respond in kindness. And that is not just speaking of outwardly refraining from reacting in anger, but an inward heart reaction as well. Paul stated in verse 5 of this chapter that we are members one of another and showing how close-knit the body of Christ is and how involved God would have us be in each other's lives. He says we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Warren Wiersbe put it well and he said, Christian fellowship is much more than a pat on the back and a handshake on Sunday morning. It means sharing the burdens and the blessings of others so that we all grow together and glorify the Lord. Being body members and as a close-knit family, we should naturally feel each other's joys and sorrows. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. As we are kindly affectioned one to another, and let our love be without dissimulation, we'll naturally rejoice with others when they rejoice, we'll feel, feel each other's pain, and weep with others in the body of Christ too. As our Lord is, God would have us be sympathetic and compassionate. Romans chapter 12, verse 16 says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Being of the same mind one toward another means that all should have this same kind of attitude toward one another, that there should be this mutual, sincere love, care, desire to serve the Lord, pray, have that sympathy towards one another. Uh, that all this, these things that Paul's been explaining here in these verses, that we should all have this same kind of mindset. And Paul shows how our mind shouldn't be. You know, we should not be setting our mind or inspiring after high things in the church, meaning only befriending or serving a certain class in the church or aspiring after so-called high positions in the church. Instead, Paul reminds us that we should be ministering to all people, be cultivating relationships with all believers, not just with certain in the church, and especially, as he goes on in there, this verse, to make sure that we are ministering to people of low estate, the cast down, the downtrodden in the church. And Paul says, don't be wise in your own conceits or don't have too high of an estimate of yourselves causing you to not minister to the neglected and people of low estate in the church. God loves all people, so should we, and love should be without hypocrisy. Tom Rayner tells the following true story. Gloria was ready to take her life. Years of drug abuse, failed relationships, and multiple rejections had taken their toll. Prepared with countless prescription drugs she'd saved for the purpose, Gloria turned on the television to keep her neighbors from hearing. The channel was tuned into a Billy Graham crusade. The bottom of the screen was a telephone number for anyone needing help. Gloria called the number before she took the pills. The counselor recognized the seriousness of Gloria's situation. She directed Gloria to a nearby church where someone would be able to help her. Gloria decided to put off her suicide and attend the church the next day on Sunday. Just before the worship service began, Gloria met the pastor. She said, Billy Graham sent me. And sometime later, Gloria gave this testimony. Billy Graham saved me from killing myself, but my church showed me how to be saved from my sins through Christ. The love of the people was incredible. I never knew someone as dirty as me could ever receive love again. 
The people accepted me just as I was. I have seen Christ. He is in the faces of all these people who love me. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 18 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. The word recompense speaks of repaying, giving in return, rendering back. Paul's teaching here is simply that when believers are treated wrongly, they're not to react by returning evil. In other words, not to seek revenge. And notice that we're to recompense to no man, whether believer or unbeliever. We are to put away any and all thoughts of getting even. A mother ran into a bedroom when she heard her seven-year-old son scream. She found his two-year-old sister pulling his hair. She gently released the little girl's tight grip and said comfortingly to the boy, there, there, she didn't mean it. She doesn't know that it hurts. And he nodded and she left the room. She started down the hall, the little girl screamed. And she rushed back in the room and asked, what happened? And the little boy said, she knows now. <laughs> and like this story, we're not to seek revenge, but rather we should provide things honest in the sight of all men. The word honest means good, honorable, right. What Paul is saying is by grace, make it a matter of principle to do what's right. Take care to do what's honorable. The believer must take care to take the high road, live on a higher level, not return evil for evil as is usually done. And this provides a strong testimony of Christ's love and grace and that we are not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind when we carry these kind of instructions out. Paul's further instruction is, if it be possible, giving every effort as much as lieth within you, live in peace, dwell in harmony with all people. Galatians 5.22 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. As the Holy Spirit produces this fruit in our life, we can live this verse out. Paul implies that if it is impossible for there to be peace and harmony, we should be sure that the difficulty does not lie with us. God desires His own to be peace lovers, peace livers, and peacemakers, and He desires His peace to touch all our relationships. Romans 12, verses 19 to 21 read, Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hungry, hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Self-vengeance, revenge, has no place in the believer's life. Rather, Paul he does so by pulling at their heartstrings when he says, Dearly beloved. He tells them, Make room for divine retribution, or to give way unto God's wrath. He quotes Deuteronomy 32 35 here, and he shows how only God has the right to avenge. Vengeance is divine ground, and it will be carried out one day. And it's divine ground because, as William R. Newell insightfully puts it, God's vengeance must require that infinite knowledge of conditions, of motives, of results upon others, which God, the just judge, alone possesses. We are not to seek revenge on those who have wronged us, which is divine ground, and which may drive or keep an unbeliever from God and from ever trusting Christ. Rather, our duty is to treat our enemy in love and kindness, as Paul shows, quoting Proverbs 25, 22, give him something to eat or drink when he's hungry or thirsty. By an act of love to our enemy, demonstrating a love without dissimulation or hypocrisy, God's love, that is, this may lead to coals of fire being heaped on our enemy's head. Now, coals of fire on the head hurts, especially on my head. I don't have any protection there. And so, the coals of like coals of fire hurt in the head, so does an act of kindness to one who does us wrong, producing the pain of remorse, shame, a convicted conscience, and the reflection caused by that pain can lead to a change of heart and possibly their salvation by the Holy Spirit working in their life. 
And that's the aim, because God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He desires all people to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. And so we should not over be overcome of evil by giving in to the temptation to seek retaliation or pursue revenge, which can, can consume ourselves and our lives and thinking. Rather, we should overcome evil with good, with acts of kindness, with forgiveness, with the love of the Savior, seeking to win that person to Him. Greg Asimakopoulos tells the following true account. Many of us can think about loving our enemy in esoteric terms. Unknown enemies on the other side of the world are easier to love than those we meet face to face. During the war in Iraq in 2005, one American soldier found out how proximity changes things. Stephen Scheiderer, an army medic, met his enemy's bullet before he met his enemy. While patrol patrolling the dangerous streets of Baghdad, Scheiderer was shot in the chest by an enemy sniper. Although he was knocked to the ground by the impact, Scheiderer was saved by his bulletproof vest. In company with the combat team that tracked down the sniper, the soldier discovered his assailant had been wounded. At this point, loving one's enemy was no longer a theoretical concept. The enemy was directly in front of Scheiderer, and he was wounded and in need of prompt medical attention. Only moments earlier, the sniper had put Steven Scheiderer's heart between the crosshairs on the scope of his rifle and pulled the trigger, fully intending to end Scheiderer's life. Scheiderer could have roughed him up. He could have simply walked away and justified his actions. Instead, Scheiderer treated and dressed the wounds of the man who had just tried to take his life. Along with showing us the character and quality of soldiers we have defending our freedoms, this soldier shows us the Christian discipline of being not overcome with evil, not giving in to feelings of vengeance, but overcoming that evil with good and with kindness. And that's being like our God, because God showed love and kindness to His enemies by sending His own Son to die for us, the supreme act of kindness and love. And we should follow be imitators of God in this. Romans 5.10 says, When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.BereanBibleSociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750 or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society P.O. Box 756 Germantown, Wisconsin 53022 Now until next time may you be transformed by God's grace